The Thai dear sisters, dear brothers, welcome to our fourth class on the 40 tenets. It's um, the 7th of April in the year 2021, and we're in the Stillwater Meditation Hall of Deer Park Monastery, or sorry, the Ocean of Peace Meditation Hall. Stillwater Meditation Hall is in Upper Hamlet. <laughs> so, it turns out that we suffer because of our ideas about our feelings and our ideas about our body. So we think that we, when we have a painful feeling, that that feeling is me. And so when we're sick and it feels like there's no peace at all in our body, then we identify completely with those painful feelings and we say, this, these feelings are me and we find no way out of the suffering. And uh, all that we're learning here is to find a way to become free <laughs> of our suffering. And the insight of Buddhism is that the freedom from suffering comes from understanding suffering. So, so when we're sick and our body is in pain, we can practice to uh, see our feelings as a uh, conditioned phenomena um, because of causes and conditions those painful feelings arise and we no longer are stuck or attached to those feelings but they are they are manifesting just like a rainbow manifests with the right condition of water vapor and the, the, the sun uh, just like uh, a seed sprouts from the earth that is there when the rain comes in the spring. And uh, our feelings are also of that nature. So they have conditions and... Um, and when we identify with those feelings and we say those feelings are me, that is when we uh, get stuck. <laughs> so in the last class we talked about the uh, upadana, the stickiness, <laughs> the, the tendency to, to stick to our body, to stick to our feelings, to stick to our ideas and notions. It's also <coughs> a word that's used to describe fuel. So when, if we think of a, a fire, burning, maybe, can use some red. <laughs> And when we look at the, the, the fuel, we can see the fire is sticking to the fuel. <laughs> so that is uh, the meaning of upadana. It's like this, uh, the, the, the phenomena that the flame is uh, dependent on the fuel. It sticks. It's, it's, it seems to be... Uh, So, so based on that, uh, that uh, understanding from just looking at the a fire, we have this sense of upadana as attachment. It is like the, the, the fire of our affliction sticking <laughs> to our, our body, our feelings. And we can see the, the, like the skandhas, like, a, like the fuel. Yeah. So that's why we... we uh, upadana also has that meaning of the fuel. And in the early text of Buddhism, the Buddha, when he talked about the five skandhas, he, as we learned in the last class, he often 
use the phrase upadana skanda. <laughs> so it means uh, that it's not only about the skandhas, these aggregates of form, like bodily form, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, and consciousness, but it's, it's the flame, the stickiness <laughs> of, of, this, of afflictions that uh, arise when, we, when this attachment is there. Attachment to our body, attachment to our feelings, attachment to our perceptions, our mental formations, our consciousness. And so, and so the term nirvana means extinction. It means the fire goes out. <laughs> There's no more fuel. Nirvana is extinction, and so we can think of it as extinction of the fire. So we find a way to, that by removing the fuel, we remove the fuel, then the fire no longer has sufficient conditions to manifest. There's no longer we're no longer treating our body as a source of fuel for our fictions, <laughs> but rather we, we remove the stickiness, <laughs> the grasping energy. Upadana skanda. Skanda, the five. Uh, and so our practice is how to <laughs> stop sticking <laughs> through our thinking, our perceptions. We stick to our feelings. So when we have a pleasant feeling, it's associated with a perception and that we try to um, find a way to create, make manifest that perception again so that we can have the pleasant feeling. So we might have a very pleasant feeling um, about a time when we were with our family, with our mother and our father, and everything was so wonderful. Uh, in our heart, we have the memory of that moment. But everything seemed perfect in the world. But then there's still suffering that comes. <laughs> it's impermanent. And our, f our parents maybe uh, grow old and die, or they divorce, and there's bitterness. Um, Maybe if we were uh, married, we were in a relationship, and then that marriage d falls apart. Um, maybe we suffer because of uh, when our son or our daughter grows up, then they live in a way that brings them much suffering, and we suffer because they suffer. <laughs> but we hold on to that memory of happiness when everything seemed perfect, and we try to recreate it. And so we try to bring the family together at the holiday. But then when they come together, they, they argue with each other and they complain. <laughs> and it's not the wonderful memory that we imagine. So we are stuck on our perception. And we think, if I only recreate those conditions, I will be happy. So that is why in uh, you know, Thai, our teacher, often said that our biggest obstacle to happiness is our idea of happiness. So we need to be able to let go of our idea of happiness in, to, in order to touch happiness, to touch nirvana. And that means uh, the practice of letting go is the way of unsticking ourselves, <laughs> releasing. There's like, uh, um, if you look at the, a, a re representation of the human body, based on the number of neurons associated, motor neurons associated with the parts of our body, then we look very funny. Uh, our hands appear huge <laughs> because the number of motor neurons in our brain associated with the movement of our hands are, are, are out of far, far greater than those associated with, say, the movement of our elbow or the movement of our... Um, I don't know, our leg or, or, or you know, our hip, maybe. 
because we have very articulated hands, these marvelous hands. And we've learned, uh, we've developed, uh, m many of our skills as human beings have come from our, our ability to manipulate our fingers and our hands. Um, and we know that uh, from the study of neuroscience, of people who have lost a limb, that they often suffer so much because they're the limb that they've lost, it's not only that they've lost the limb, but the limb is actually uh, very strongly clenched. <laughs> it's a phenomenon that's happened, that happens to many people who lose a limb. And they're not able to release, uh, many of them are not able to release that clenched fist. The, the limb is no longer there, but the, in their mind, the motor neurons associated with that hand are, are like, and, and they are very tightly clenched, and they, they are, for, for many days, and some of them for years, they're not able to release and relax that limb. And so they, uh, one professor, I don't remember his name right now. Um, I almost remember it, but I'm, I'll probably get it wrong, so I won't say. <laughs> right here in San Diego, a uh, very brilliant, uh, simple technique which he devised where he actually would um, put a mirror and make it a, so in such a way that it appeared that the other intact limb of that person appeared to be also there, where their limb should be, uh, their missing limb. And by looking in the mirror and seeing their, the mirror image of their other arm, they're actually able to relax, finally, to relax their, their, it's called phantom limb syndrome. So they're able to relax this phantom limb that is no longer there. So I tell that story just to illustrate that within us, there is a, there is a kind of hand, and it's always grasping. <laughs> it's grasping at our, as we learned last week, the five, They're like a slices of a tangerine. We have the slice of our body, the slice of our feelings, slice of our perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. So your body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations and consciousness. And we are exercising that, <laughs> that internal uh, hand that is grasping at our body, is grasping at our feelings. We have a pleasant feeling, we want to have more of it. And as we learned, the, these are also feeding into one another. Just thinking about that moment of happiness with our family brings pleasant feelings. And so we want, to, uh, we want to bring about the kind of volition as a mental formation to make that happen, to bring our family together again, to recreate the conditions of happiness that existed in the past. But because many conditions may have changed, we, we actually have the perception that we're not appreciated, that we, our family, we put all this effort in, and they come together and they still complain about each other and make nasty jokes about each other. <laughs> and we suffer so much <laughs> because all we wanted was that feeling of happiness. We were grasping at it. And so we do everything in our mental formations to try to create the conditions for happiness. But if we're able to let go, this is the insight of the Buddha. If we practice releasing, phantom limb within us, <laughs> which is always the, the phantom fist or um, <laughs> hand that is grasping at our body, at our feelings, at our perceptions, through training our mind. Just breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. I let go of the future, of the past, breathing out, 
I know I'm breathing out. It's just mindfulness of the breathing. breath is a wonderful object of meditation because no matter how hard you try to grasp onto it, you cannot stick it. <laughs> it's very hard to stick to your breath. And so the Buddha proposed the breathing meditation as a way to train ourselves to practice letting go. So many of us, when we begin to bring our attention to our breathing, we get stuck with uh, trying to control our breathing. And so we get caught in the muscles around our lungs and our diaphragm. And the, because we've had so much conditioning to um, try to control whatever we put our attention on. We look at the screen, we have the mouse, right? We control the mouse, we go around. I open this, I open that, <laughs> right? And that is a kind of conditioning. We see it, we want to change what we see. And Buddhism teaches us to observe what is going on within us and around us, through our eyes, our ears, our nose, tongue, body, mind, and let go. Let go of trying to control, trying to manipulate through our six senses, our body, our feelings, our perceptions, and so forth. And then we feel free. <laughs> and we have much less fear. Because we see this body is just a manifestation. And it is subject to death. <laughs> it is subject to being born and subject to dying. It is a condition phenomenon really a condition, a set of millions and millions of phenomena <laughs> that are the cells in our body metabolizing sugars, generating energy, taking in the oxygen from our breathing and using it as a, uh, in a catalytic reaction to produce energy in our cells so we can move our muscles, we can digest the food that we eat, we can continue to breathe, we can feed uh, our brain, uh, all those neural connections which are firing and you know, low wattage electricity, um, electrical firings. That's all going on. This is wonderful manifestation. And, and in, the wonderful thing is that it, it goes on really quite well without our intervention, <laughs> without an I or a me to make it happen. If you let go of your ideas about yourself, you continue to breathe, you continue to smile, you continue, and, and usually you'll feel much happier. <laughs> I remember one uh, monk, Ajahn Sum Sumedho, uh, he used to say, when I think about myself, I feel depressed. <laughs> and he wasn't saying that in the sense of, uh, because I'm a lousy person. But it's, he's literally saying, when I think about a self, when I have an idea about a self, I get stuck. I think I am like this, and I am not like that. And ideas like I am and I am not, as we, we are learning, are always going to lead to suffering. <laughs> and they're always delusional. So letting go of our attachment is about removing delusion, uprooting our tendency to fantasize, to speculate about reality.
So last week we learned the third uh, tenet, which is that nirvana is the cessation of delusion and the afflictions. In, in Sanskrit, avidya. I don't like to, I don't want to use too many Sanskrit terms, but there are some that are very important. So, avidya, it means, uh, vid is, uh, is knowing things as they are, to know or experience, and a is a negation. So avidya is ig ignorance or delusion. Because of the stickiness, sticking to our bodies, sticking to our feelings, grasping onto our, our um, impermanent and, and fleeting uh, feelings, that is the nature of delusion, which gives rise to afflictions, klesha, which we also learned last week, klesha. <clears throat> so, in Buddhism, we don't focus so much on sin. We talk more about afflictions. Yeah, we talk about uh, unpleasant emotions like anger, irritation, jealousy, fear, because those afflictions make our present moment very unpleasant. <laughs> so somebody who's in a moment of anger is suffering very much. Mm. And that doesn't, and that doesn't mean that anger is something bad or that it's a kind of sin, but it's an affliction. It's <laughs> it feels unpleasant. When we're angry, we want to do anything we can to, to bring about the cessation of that anger. And so, we need to learn and understand the anger. And so that is why we, we, we don't want to treat it as something evil. So in Buddhism, anger is not evil. It's an affliction. We need to learn to understand it, understand its roots. So just like we remove the, the fuel from the fire, we learn how to remove the conditions that feed the flames of our anger so that it dies down. We don't repress it. Like we don't try to smother the fire. That's not nirvana. Nirvana is finding a skillful way to remove the conditions, to remove the fuel, so that the flames can no longer stick to the fuel, no longer continue to burn the fuel. So we remove the, the element of upadana. We don't remove the skandhas. This is a big misunderstanding that Thai is trying to help us to correct in some interpretations of Buddhism, they have started to say that uh, some kind of what they call nirvana without residue means when there's nirvana with the cessation of the skandhas, so the cessation of the body, the feelings and perceptions. So after the Buddha passed away, they say that he went into uh, nirvana without residue, there are no longer the five skandhas. And so we later uh, Buddhist scholars distinguish between nirvana with residue and nirvana without residue. <laughs> Makes our lives very confusing and brings about all kinds of misunderstandings. Today, the fourth tenet. Oops, I lost my place somehow.
Nirvana is Nirvana. <laughs> it's very fun. It does not need to be nirvana with residue or without residue. So this point of view has led to uh, a lot of misunderstanding. This point of view of nirvana with residue and nirvana without residue. So after the Buddha's uh, passing, mm. we know in the Buddha's time he spoke many times about nirvana and the nature of nirvana as the unconditioned, the unmade, and that is uh, not something that the Buddha acquired but that he's able to touch by letting go of his grasping on his body, his feelings, his perceptions, and so forth. Not seeing them as me, myself, or mine. And when the Buddha passed away, um, then people started to say, now the Buddha is completely uh, nirvanized. <laughs> Parinibbana <laughs> is. Um, and, and they said, well, what it is, they start to think there's some difference between the nirvana of the Buddha after he passes and the nirvana he touched while he was alive. And the main difference is, is that the nirvana he touched while he was alive was the nirvana with the residue of the five skandhas the body, the feelings, perceptions, and so forth, that continued to manifest, although the Buddha was no longer attached to his body, attached to his feelings, and so forth. So there's no upadana uh, skanda, but just the skanda, as well as the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, uh, that ob <coughs> observes the forms, feelings, uh, forms, sounds, tastes, smells, touches and tangibles and objects of mind. But all that occurs without any grasping, any stickiness. So the, so the understanding that we learned in the third tenet last week was that nirvana is the extinction, is the absence of the delusion, of delusion and the afflictions. It is not the absence of the five skandhas or the uh, the sense, the senses, the sense objects, and the sense consciousnesses. Yeah, the 18 realms, 18 datu. And so this tenet follows from that. Nirvana is nirvana. It does not need to be nirvana with residue or without residue. By the time of um, Master Tsunsang, Master Sun Sang uh, lived in the 7th century and um, traveled from China. He was determined to try to fix, uh, try to bring back teachings, sutras that were, he perceived were missing in China. So he went on a, a very adventurous um, 
trip, uh, more than 10 years, I think, almost 20 years, something like that. And very detailed, kept very detailed notes of where he went. He went along north of uh, Tibet to the um, Taklamakan Desert, now it's called, uh, and then down through the, these uh, kind of uh, iron gates, I think they call the, into uh, the Hindu Kush and down into the, 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 the valley of the Indus River and then to the Ganges. And along the way, he observed many monasteries that were thriving at that time. And so we have a, lot, a very um, detailed record of, of India at that time through his writings. And when he came back to, to China, he, he, he eventually went to Nalanda, which is in, uh, in Rajagriha, uh, near Rajagriha, near, near the Vulture's Peak. Remember that we are studying <laughs> Palm Village looking at Vulture's Peak. That is the title of this book of Tai. And so Master Sun Zhang studied with a great master uh, there in Nalanda and learned Sanskrit and then was able to come back to China and he be uh, at that time there was a lot of support for Buddhism in China and so he was actually supported by given a whole team of uh, young monks and other scholars to help him to basically uh, translate texts from Sanskrit and summarize many texts because of course there were not many people who could read Sanskrit in China at that time. And, and so he spent most of the rest of his life uh, writing down um, or translating many of the very important teachings of the manifestation-only school. And by the time of Zunzang, they're already talking about four kinds of nirvana. <laughs> so you had uh, uh, one was nirvana, uh, and it's, uh, that is pure in nature, you can say. Um, there's nirvana with residue, as we already Nirvana without residue. And Nirvana of no, uh, no abode. <laughs> So you see the great danger that is posed when we start speculating about nirvana. <laughs> so even something, you know, as I shared last time, the, the word nirvana is itself conditioned. And so we have to be very careful. Over time, we start to treat nirvana as a conditioned phenomenon. <laughs> but the very nature in, of nirvana is unconditioned. There's, not, there's no quality that can stick to nirvana. We cannot say it is blue or orange. We, we cannot even say it has anything to do with a word, that, nirvana, that's written on the board or that, is, that I'm saying out loud. It's really beyond any kind of form. And nirvana is just, it's just a word. It's just a sign. And we do not want to confuse it with the nature of nirvana. So the insight of Plum Village is that we don't need any of these. <laughs> this is just a waste of our mental energy, trying to talk about nirvana with residue, without residue, or no abode, and so forth. Nirvana is nirvana. <laughs> it's, it is, and it's, it's already pure. We, we can't even really talk about it being pure because to, for something to be impure, we create, or something to be pure, we create the impure, impure right? 
So this is uh, the insight of Plum Village. Nirvana is Nirvana. It does not need to be with or without residue. You can listen to a bell. So Tai wants us to learn about this so that we don't get trapped. Because we, in our practice, we can easily get trapped. <laughs> and he said there are many uh, uh, hooks in the teachings because of our attachment and the attachment of our ancestors. Sometimes we just uh, feel quite uh, happy in our knowledge of things and we don't want to go beyond our, our mere knowledge. Last time I talked about um, two kinds of obstacles which uh, keep us from touching nirvana. The obstacle of our affliction, Kalisha. and the obstacle of our knowledge. And so we learn klesha is afflictions, jneya is knowledge. And our daily life in in the monastery, we practice walking meditation, eating meditation, coming back to the present moment, being aware of our food, where it's come from, <coughs> appreciating the wonders of life that are here and now. And that is to help us to uh, reduce our afflictions, to see that this present moment, we already have enough conditions to be happy. If we are able to look deeply and recognize all the conditions of happiness that are already there. When we are stuck onto a feeling or stuck onto a perception, when we have that perception, we feel happy. When we don't have it, <laughs> we feel sad. <laughs> and so we suffer. And so by living together, by walking together, practicing together, and especially learning how to live together in harmony, it means letting go of our ideas in a meeting, when we have a discussion, um, I want to do it like this, you want to do it like that. And nobody wants to let go. <laughs> it's a, uh, and actually, even those perceptions, we cannot hold on to them. But we are very good at making ourselves angry and fighting for our, our position, our idea, our point of view. And so in that way, the, these are linked together, our knowledge, our idea, is also an obstacle. And what we are learning in the 40 tenets is how to remove this obstacle principally. How to understand the root of our afflictions in our attachment to our way of uh, wanting things to be or wanting things not to be. <laughs> so it's very interesting. We, we, we look in, at the world and we start to make relationships between things, since we are a very young child. Uh, Piaget, when he studied the this, this Swiss um, uh, master of child psychology, uh, when he was looking at his, uh, his children growing up, he noticed that uh, at a certain age, when, say, I have this pen, this pen and I show it to a, a, a child who is very young, maybe like one year old, and then when I put it behind my back, the child will look with wonder. They have no idea where the marker went. <laughs> where did they go? Because it's no longer in their field of vision. Something that was in their field of vision, now is gone. 
but they cannot yet establish where it might have gone. <laughs> it, is, it is not in their vision, so it, it no longer is. So this, it's very, uh, it's almost like it's very simple. When something is visible, it is. When it's no longer visible, it is not. <laughs> and then at a certain age, they're able to recognize, ah, oh, the absence of the marker means it, the, the, it's a conservation of, of matter, right? The, the, the matter has not, from something, become nothing <laughs> because it is no longer visible. But there has to be some kind of conservation of this, of matter. And so then they start to ask, well, where did the marker go? And then they pay attention, ah, I saw him put it behind him and it's no longer there. And so now they'll, they'll, they'll know to run around behind and say, ah, I found the marker, you know, and, and they know it's there because they know that things don't just disappear for no reason. And, but it turns out that a lot of us, we continue to have this kind of conceptual understanding of cause and effect. And we impose on the world our understanding of how things should be. This happens, so that should happen. Um, I studied hard, so I should get a good grade. <laughs> I, uh, um, I worked hard on my exams in high school, and I took a lot of electives, so I should get into a good university. I paid a lot of money, I got my degree at that university, so I should get a good job. <laughs> and these are all kinds of assumptions that we make, and I'm just using just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> but there are all kinds of, around color of skin, around the way people talk, around the way um, we eat, everything. We have all kinds of ideas of the way that things should be in, the, in order to bring about the good effect, <laughs> happy effect that we want, and the way things are, you know, should be avoided, things not should be done like that. And that thinking of right and wrong is actually like a, a veil which obscures our vision of how things actually are. <laughs> so we live in a kind of delusional world of the way things should be, and we miss out on the opportunity to actually see things as they are. And so when we are confronted with this cognitive dissonance between our belief system, our belief system, how things should be, and the way things are, we suffer. We suffer enormously. And so Buddhism is about letting go of our ideas of how things should be, and rather looking at the world as it is in every moment. That is a, a practice of touching, of uh, suchness, of uh, concentration on suchness. Patata. Suchness. Pata is just it, it like that. Such. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean anything except it's just it's such. It's such. And ta, the ending means a a, a, a noun, like a so it's a ta ta, it means the, the, it, the itness of things, the thusness, the thusness, suchness of things, ta ta ta. This class is fun because we get to go use the, like these terms. <laughs> it's very helpful, I find. There's not so many terms that you have to learn, but learning a few of them is helpful. It's a 2600 year old tradition and they're still we're still studying these same um, kind of uh, skillful teachings of the Buddha. And it's very lovely to go back to the, the early language because it's very simple, actually. It's not very complicated. Of course, through the years, things become very complicated. And so Tai tries to help us to <laughs> clear away all the complications that we see very clearly. And we focus more on our practice than trying to just wade through mass, massive reams of paper and scholarship and so forth.
just to try to get the essence. So the 40 tenets are there to help us to do that so we don't get caught in the hooks that are there, misunderstandings. So Tathata is always coming back to things as they are, the suchness of things, and not, um, yeah, not, uh, not getting caught in rigid ideas or dogmatic ideas about how the world is. So when we talk about impermanence, we talk about it in terms of a concentration. It's not in terms of establishing an absolute truth. This is the way things are. <laughs> impermanence is a practice. It means you, 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 with mindfulness, you become aware of the object of your attention, and you see that it has a nature to change. It's always being constantly being born and constantly dying. And so when you see that, you see that that is the nature of conditioned things. But the statement that all conditioned things are impermanent can be a trap if you get attached to it as a dogma. And somebody comes to you and says, no, there's a permanent soul. We'll live forever, eternal. And you say, no, 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 it's not like that. Because the Buddha said all things are impermanent. How it can it be like that? And you get very angry. <laughs> and you miss entirely you lose your, your, your practice. <laughs> because it's not for the sake of declaring truth that we say the Buddha said all conditioned things are impermanent. It's for the sake of making us free from our suffering. <laughs> because we get attached to things and we think of them as being permanent, we suffer. So even, we, even the Dhamma, we need to be able to let go of it, let alone non-Dhamma. And that is the teaching of the raft. So the Buddha, um, in the Sutra on um, the better way to catch a snake, or sometimes it's called the Sutra of the Vulture Trainer because it's a teaching the Buddha gives to a monk who caught in his idea about um, about sense pleasures, and he, he's, he's dogmatically caught. He has a wrong view that the Buddha taught that sense pleasures are not an obstacle to the practice, to freedom. And he was a vulture. He, before he became a monk, he trained vultures. He trained, uh, they, he trained birds to hunt. And so the Buddha offered the teachings. My teachings are like a raft. meaning of that is that uh, a man comes to the river and he sees he cannot cross over the river and so he gathers together some reeds and um, grasses and he starts weaving together a raft out of the grasses and reeds and, um, and then he uses that raft to cross the river and putting all that effort in <laughs> to making the raft, when he gets to the other side, to the other shore of the river, then he thinks, wow, there are many other rivers I may need to cross. What if I picked up this raft and I carried it with me? <laughs> so the next time I come to a river, I will already have my raft and I can cross the river. And so the man maybe tries to pick up the raft. It's very heavy and he's sweating and he cannot go very far <laughs> carrying that raft. And the Buddha said, now, is that man very intelligent? And the, the monks say, no, he's not very intelligent. And he said, well, another man comes along and he does the same, but when he crosses to the other shore, then he leaves the raft there. Perhaps someone else will be able to use it to cross back <laughs> to the other shore. But he doesn't do it only because he's a generous person, but also because he's intelligent and he knows that, uh, that uh, when he gets to the next river, he will be able to, using his skills that he learned from making the raft, he'll be able to make another raft. <laughs> and it would be very wearisome 
very tiring for him to carry that raft to the next river. And so that metaphor, the Buddha used that story um, to discuss, to, to illustrate how we need to treat the Dhamma. The Dhamma is like a raft. We need to be able to, when we touch, when we reach the other shore, to let go of the raft, <laughs> leave it behind. So even the Dhamma, when we touch, we're able to touch Nirvana, we need to not get attached to it and not get attached to the words, the phrasing, like in a dogmatic way, like it's a belief, because all of the teachings are just expedient. They're just there to help us to get to the other shore, <laughs> but not for us to then cling on to them and hold on to them and, and, and like some dogma or belief. My teachings are like a raft. Um, you need to let go to let go of them, how much more so n n wrong teachings. Literally, he, he said, let go of the Dharma. How much more so a Dharma, it means a non-Dharma. What is wrong Dhamma? It is uh, believing that this body is permanent, <laughs> will last forever. <laughs> it is uh, the belief that uh, we have feelings that uh, will last forever, that um, um, that if we grasp and, and we uh, splurge and, and overwhelm our senses with all kinds of sense pleasures that that will lead to lasting happiness. This is a kind of wrong understanding. It's not uh, held up my experience. And so we, but we can tell ourselves that. And we have to look in the ways in which advertising, the way in which the websites that we go to are constantly reinforcing the kind of belief that leads, that is in we could say is the wrong teaching. We have to let go of the Dhamma, even, even more so non-Dhamma. Maybe you, you look on your Twitter feed, or you even just looking at the newspaper. It can be watering the seeds of uh, sense pleasure, reinforcing the idea that you can get happiness somewhere else. If you can be somebody important, somebody who's on the cover of a magazine, somebody who's on the cover of, a, of the newspaper, then you will have unending bliss, <laughs> right? Everything will be perfect because you'll be a star, right? <laughs> and I think most of us would right away think that idea is crazy, but somehow, even if we think the idea is crazy, we still behave in such a way we want to know what those people are doing, those important people in the newspaper, those important people on the cover of the magazine. And we say, oh, well, we just want to know because we're looking into the nature of human suffering. <laughs> but you can do that just fine yourself. <laughs> of course, we can always learn from other people's experiences, but be careful because uh, one w wrong way of grasping this teaching is that <laughs> people stop studying the Dhamma. They say, I don't need the Dhamma. The Buddha said the Dhamma is like a raft. I leave it behind. But they spend the rest of their time <laughs> attached to you know, their Twitter feed or their, their reading newspapers or whatever and watering the seeds of anger, desire, jealousy, and so forth. So we, we need to let go of them both, not just <laughs> the Dhamma. That is the teaching on the, 
uh, the Dhamma as a raft. And by doing that, then we train ourselves. We notice when we're caught in an idea and we're able to calm ourselves down and come back to, to reality, to the direct observation of things without the, the stickiness of our sticking to our perceptions, sticking to our mental formations that want to impose our idea on the world. And then you have your, your, that is uh, the practice of engaged Buddhism. Then you are able to, to, to help. <laughs> Somebody who's living in a delusive idea, caught in their, their judgments, their worries, their fears, is not able to do very much to help others, to suffer less. It's like the blind leading the blind. So of course there are situations of injustice and there's real suffering in the world, but we need to be able to <laughs> see things as they are in order to help, in order to touch the true compassion and be able to relieve the suffering of ourselves and others. And so that is the, the deep practice of a bodhisattva, the, the practice of awakening. So this, this, this story of nirvana with residue or without residue is a product of uh, too much thinking about nirvana, adding, trying to add different qualities onto nirvana. And it's much simpler than that. Nirvana is nirvana. That's it. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> Even if we could, you know, what the point is to touch nirvana, right? It's not to talk about nirvana. It, it's there as, a, as a, a finger pointing at the moon, right? We don't get caught in the finger. The finger is the word nirvana. We want to directly look at the beauty of the moon. That is the, the unconditioned nature, yeah, not the sign that is there to indicate it. So whether we use the term God, whether we say use the term nirvana, Allah, <laughs> whatever it is, Yahweh, it's all just sign, right? Helping us to touch what cannot be expressed, what cannot be qualified, what cannot be, what is unconditioned and uncreated. And, uh, yeah, so we have to be careful of a path that is uh, training us to get caught in our ideas. The Buddha, Buddhism is ideas, words, helping us to release ourselves from our attachment to, <laughs> to words and to concepts and to, to grasping on our five skandhas. Maybe we can hear a sound of the bell. So how can we describe nirvana? So the Buddha, we do have um, passed down sayings of the Buddha doing his best to try to describe nirvana for the purpose of awakening, his helping his students to wake up.
So in the Udana, um, which are the exhortations or, or heartfelt utterances of the Buddha, there is a section on Nirvana. This is uh, Udana 8.3. The Buddha is at uh, Shavasti in Jetta's Grove in Anatta Pindika's monastery teaching the, the Buddhas, uh, sorry, teaching the bhikshus, the monks. And he says, uh, there is O monks. Vocative, we just uh, write, oh, huh? oh, monks. <laughs> there is, oh, monks, the not born. The not produced. Or you could say, not arisen. The not made. The not conditioned. Or the, you could also say the, the unborn, the unproduced, the unmade. If there were no not born, maybe we'll say, if there were no unborn, unmade, Unproduced. Unproduced, unmade, unconditioned. then you would find no escape. No escape here from the born. produced the made. The condition. Tatiya 
Nibbana Pati Samyutta Sutta. <laughs> Pati is third, the third nirvana, um, and this, the third section, the third text, Sutta, in the um, nirvana section. But since there is an unborn, unproduced, unmade, and unconditioned, an escape is found from the born, produced, made, and conditioned. That's a, I don't write it there, but it's, you can add. There is amongst the not born, the not produced, the not made, the unconditioned. If there, sorry, if there were, no unborn, unproduced, unmade, unconditioned, then you, <laughs> missing words here, you would find no escape here from the born, the produced, the made, the conditioned. But as there is the unborn, the unproduced, the unmade, the unconditioned, that is why you can find escape from the born, the produced, the made, the conditioned. So this is the Buddha trying his best <laughs> using words to describe nirvana. <laughs> At other times he just said, how can one describe nirvana? <laughs> and he, I almost imagine the Buddha, although I don't think the Buddha would have just thrown up his hands. <laughs> you, can, you can kind of feel that like, you just at some point you just can't. It's a silence and the very presence of the Buddha, that's all we can um, used to attest to our trust in the awakening <laughs> of the teacher. In, in uh, another sutra, I, I won't write it down, but uh, the Buddha says, there is, O bhikkhus, that dimension where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no wind, no dimension of infinite space, no dimension of infinite consciousness, no dimension of nothingness, no dimension of neither perception nor non-perception, no this world, no other world, no moon or sun. There, mendicants, there, O bhikshus, I say, there is no coming or going, no remaining or passing away or reappearing. It is not established, does not proceed, and has no support. It's unconditioned. Justice is the end of suffering. So you notice that uh, there's a lot of negation in here. <laughs> in order to describe the unconditioned, we have to strip away everything that is conditioned. So there's not this, not that, not that, not that. And yet, there is still this trap of understanding nirvana as being this identical, identical to uh, nihilism, to annihilation. And that is a wrong understanding, as we already learned. So um, nirvana is the absence of delusion and the afflictions. Not, it, it, it can be witnessed by means of the skandhas, by means of the condition. So you, in the historical dimension, we touch the ultimate. <laughs> it is right in the heart of the historical. We don't try to get rid of the historical dimension of the world of phenomena, of birth and death, coming and going, being and non-being, same and different. We don't try to rid ourselves of that. Like We are disgusted with the historical dimension. We want to live in the ultimate dimension in every moment of our daily life. And so we try to push away <laughs> the historical dimension. That is a wrong understanding, a nihilistic understanding. And that is like, uh, we, by cutting off life, we touch nirvana. That is a very wrong way of grasping. And so in the Sutra on the Better Way to Catch a Snake, there's, uh, the Buddha talked about the danger of these wrong views. So even though we are negating, we are describing nirvana by means of negation, that doesn't mean that it is a, 
uh, rejection of life. In fact, it is the opposite. <laughs> it is the freeing of life. It is where we able to, as human beings, go beyond our uh, jealousies, our angers, our worry, our fear, all these things that, we s that keep us stuck to our body in, and be really free. And that's something that we can touch in the present moment. And uh, I think that will be the, the next uh, tenet, the fifth tenet. It is possible to touch nirvana in the present moment. It means in the historical dimension, you can touch the ultimate dimension. And that will be the next class. <laughs> so thank you, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, for following along. And I encourage those of us joining online for the first time to take the moment to go back and start uh, from the first class. This is the fourth class. And also to follow the links on the video to the, the 40 tenets so you can follow along. I try my best to write large on the board, but maybe it's hard to, to follow my writing. So it's better to have the, the text there with you. And, and hopefully if we have more time, maybe we can create, make more materials available, like, like these, some of these suttas that are, sutras that are quoted and, and so forth. But I have to see if we have uh, enough capacity. <laughs> So thank you. We'll finish with three sounds of the bell, come back to our breathing and enjoy enjoy uh, just being present with our body without any attachment, without any grasping. <laughs> 